The struggle for freedom and decolonization is not anew to indigenous people in the world community. We have seen it in South Africa, in Beijing, in Poland. In fact, decolonization and freedom is one of the greatest struggles that will never leave the agenda of the world leaders until it is addressed honestly, without political or economic gain as the motivating force by the developed nations of the world, including Canada. It was a great day for Spanish Indian people on September the 1st, 1988, because it was then that we took back the responsibility for the education of our children. We raise our Spanish flag today, and it will fly as long as Indian people are not a real part of the Canadian Constitution. feel and I know that I have a very different perspective on the Indigenous student. The Indigenous student as a learner, as a cultural being, and on the intergenerational uh, trauma that has been passed down from my mom's generation, from my grandma's generation, from my great-grandpa and great-grandmother's generation. And this Canadian history has shaped the overall education of our people and the relationship with educational institutions as well. Um, my grandfather uh, avoided residential school. He only went to school up to grade three because of that. Um, though he later received an honorary doctor of laws from UVic and other things for his amazing work in saving the Sanchathan language or helps working with others to save the Sanchathan language. My grandmother wasn't so fortunate. She, she did go to residential school. Um, you know, I know that that was a, I don't think that I'll share all of it here. It was a very difficult situation, you know, there was awful things that were done to her. You know, after she left residential school at 16 or was essentially kicked out, aged out of being in school, she went to the police to try and report what they did to people at these schools and they told her to leave. So she went down to California and she taught herself how to read and write. She wasn't taught that, she was forced to work in residential school. So intergenerational trauma is trauma that happened to someone's ancestors and the effects are still being felt today because past generations never had a chance to heal. And without healing, there is no change. My name is Charlene Hickey. I'm currently a master's in counseling student at the University of Victoria. I think that I always knew I wanted to be a counselor, even if I didn't know what the name counselor meant. My work specifically focuses on trauma from an attachment lens. So we're looking at the families and the bonds that children had with their parents, and then we're trying to recreate these bonds in the therapeutic setting. Using horses in a counseling setting is helpful. 
because often people coming to counselling don't have secure attachments. So they're able to bond more easily with animals than they are with people. I think when I got pregnant with my son, I realized that I had to do something more with my life. And then I realized that education is the next step to improving my life. When you, when you look at the small world community, when people have decided they want to be free, the first thing they do is get control of their education. And when we say get control of our education, we don't mean that the leaders get control or that a single group gets control. We mean everybody has to get involved, the children, the elders, the parents. They have to mold the ideas that are going into the minds of these children. This is the decolonization process. This is what Indian control of Indian education means. Can you sound out the word for me? Here comes the women! Oh, you skipped a page! There has been a history of mistrust, rightfully so, a history of abuse, and a history of trauma experienced within educational institutions. It is my job as an Indigenous educator to advocate for those youth. I had to get a Western education in order to ensure my Indigenous reclamation. But I'm proud that I'm a Sanish person. I learned well the traditions of our people. And as time grew, as I, I grew, and then they transmitted to a residential school, which I don't have too good a memories of. You know, it was, wasn't all that good to talk about. Because at that time, they had told us that we cannot speak or we cannot practice our our way as Native people. But we carried on our traditions, our ways. And I think today that, you know, I'm one of the people that are very proud that I did stick to talking my language and teaching the history of our people as I am now. And hopefully that you children will be proud that you're Saanich people. One of the people from Saanich said to me that the old people have a song and we are their echo. In order for education to be a meaningful tool in reshaping the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, then we need to take into account Indigenous perspectives on education and the ways in which our narratives around education are shaped by and informed by the voices and echo of our ancestors and their teachings.